Right, well welcome back to my weekly yarns. I should we change the title to Weekly Whinge. Yeah, UPS again. Earlier in the week we ordered some more steel for these new legs. Or was it last week? I think it was maybe late last, oh, it was late last week ordered the new steel for the legs. You get no messages, you don't get any text messages, you don't get any emails off them. All you get is a little slip of paper I pushed through your door. We try to deliver this parcel a day for you. We kind of sort of took it away. We haven't bothered knocking on any of us. We didn't leave it in your safe place that we told you that you told us about. So we just took it away and we'll re-deliver it tomorrow for you. So today we me and the wife in between she's popped out for to take my mother to the chiropodists and things like that. But I have sat in the sitting room all day today from about half ten. I nipped out early this morning in the garage, do 30, 40 seconds worth of video, um, looking at that what axle, because it got painted yesterday. Um, I knocked it into the garage last night because it looked as if it was going, it was threatening to rain straight after the painting job. Um, so I hurriedly put it back in the garage. I got it out in the sunlight today to have a good look at it. It was fine. Um, after that, I came into the house and I have sat in the sitting room all day and not done a thing, waiting for UPS to deliver a parcel. Because the, the little slip of paper you get, there's a number on the bottom. So you go ups.com, you put the number in, and all it says is it'll be delivered tomorrow before the close of business. And you think, great. Now, my garage, if it's 50 steps from the front door, it's lucky. Right? There, when they knock on the door, because they don't ring the bell, they knock on your front door, which you can't hear in the garage, but even if you could, by the time you get to the front door, they've gone. You ring them up, they complain, but I'll tell you what you do. You go onto the website. So you go on to Trustpilot, and you find that 83% of their customers, residential customers, think you're a load of shite. They really do. And yet no one's taking any notice. What is going on in the UK at the minute? All of our services seem to be dropping to bits and nobody gives them monkeys. I think our politicians are far too busy filling their pockets. But uh, no, no, it's starting to get really silly anyway. Welcome to the weekly yarns. Forget about the weekly whinges, this is the weekly yarns. What have we done this week? Monday. Went in the garage on Monday and seriously started looking at these, the possibility of doing these legs and that and think, yeah, that'll work. I was going to nip across to the farm. I was going to bring the gearbox case and home. And then I start looking at like logistically. And I'm thinking to myself, if I put that big casting in the garage, plus the axle in the garage, loose, standing around, I'm not going to have any room left. So um, we decided we would put the axle, because it had been wire wheeled, it was dusty, wanted a good wash. Um, and I, <laughs> I stuck my fingers in. And if you go through the holes, either end of the axle, where your seals go in, and if you follow the back face of the, the brake, where the brake shoes fit, if you follow that, the back face of that down, where the casting curls around, there's a well right there. And I hadn't noticed it. I had looked through inside, I had looked from inside out. You can't see this. The only way you find it is stick your little fingers in and it come up minging. So, it was dusty from the grinding anyway, so I thought, right, it's going back across the farm, it's going to get another wash, get cleaned out. We'll get the, the lance into those corners, get that washed out, which we did. We've got all that sorted out. Um, we came home, we got it masked off. The biggest part of it, I think the next morning, all I had to do was take it off the frame, off the support, mask where the support was, put the support back on, stick it back on the frame so we can rotate it and move it. Um, it's too big a lump just to lie on the floor and try and work your way around it. Um, so got all that done. Tuesday, 
we had a really, really busy day. Um, we had a load of well, cooker packed up. We had to source a new cooker. We had to uh, get across to the farm. We had to go and see my mother. That was just... I think we left the house at half past nine in the morning. We got back at something like nearly three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, <clears throat> so, we're really busy. But we got a load of jobs done. Absolute load of jobs done. Which was good. And it was... You think, if you get all that jobs out the way at the beginning of the week, you've then got the rest of the week to play with your tractor. In it. But uh, wasn't to be. Wednesday. Um... Finished the taping off on Wednesday morning. Dropped it on the floor, taped that up. Got it right, it was blown a gale. Absolutely blown a gale. Got it all prepared, I got it out in my back garden down here. Got it all out in the back garden because the weather forecast was for later on that evening that the wind was going to drop. And it did, it did back off. Enough to get out there and get it painted. Whizzed out, got it painted. Had to watch the weather because the, the sky said it was going to rain. But it um, it didn't. It stayed dry. We've got to put it back in the garage. Got it out of the way. But it was brilliant. Over the moon with a finish on it. I Over the moon with a finish on it. Right. So. Bits we're getting done this week. Bits we've ordered. We've had to order two litres of Davy Brown chocolate paint. I ran out a while ago. Um... I think I ran out when I did the PTO case. That's why the PTO is still in primer. And I didn't didn't get a chocolate one because I either didn't have enough paint to do it or I didn't have any paint to do it. One of the two, I can't remember. But I've ordered two litres of paint. And I'm in two... That'll be, I've just had an email. It's on its way. So I'm in two minds as to whether to wait till the paint arrives... And then spray that axle chocolate before we marry all the bits up. Because the gearbox case is done. The lid isn't. The gearbox lid isn't done. But the gearbox case is. Um, so we can, I might wait till the paint arrives. And now we can get the back axle done. And get it all married up together. The only thing with that is. Where the gearbox fastens onto the back axle. You mask off the engineered, the machined face on the axle case. But you know that the gearbox is smaller than that. So if I paint that gear, that axle, and whip the tapes off and put the two together, I'm going to have a nice big shiny piece of steel around the edge of the gearbox. So I'm tempted to put the two together and try and paint it as a wanna. We'll see. We'll, we'll give that a bit more thought and we'll see what we're doing. So as you can tell, chocolate paint arrived. This is the second coat. Red bits are cardboard and masking. I'm not doing the discs on the end because that's where your brakes go. But uh, on the second coat, there's half, maybe half a coat left in the gun and there's one or two spots that would just blow over the top off. We'll give it 15, 20 minutes and we'll get it finished. Um, the oil pressure gauge arrived. That was brilliant, you know, good job done there. The whoever delivered that one left it with a neighbour, spot on. You know, my neighbours are great here, they love taking in parcels for us. But we've got the pressure gauge, I need, I think it's an M8 fitting on the back. Um, and I th the hole in the block is caught a BSP. So, I need to just rig up a little, and I want it on the end of a little bit of pipe anyway. I don't want it, I'm not going to stick it straight into the block, I'm going to... I want it away from the block um, so that it's not vibrating so it's nice and still and steady we can read it nice and clearly because I do want to put in the starter motor once we get the cases together I want the starter motor in and I want that engine turned over so that it builds oil pressure the injectors aren't in yet and speaking of injectors I've just today ordered an injector tester pump uh, to test at what point the injectors open and the spray pattern and whether they're dribbling so I've ordered that that should be on its way I think it said Monday Monday the 8th is that right be Monday the 8th it'll be due to be delivered hopefully hopefully UPS doesn't get it again but uh, yeah because I was 
I watched Lance. Lance had a, a video out. He's MF65, is it? You know, Massey Ferguson 65, part 43, servicing these injectors. And I was going to take mine through to auto diesel. Auto diesel would test them for nothing. And, you know, they'll do that for you. They'll test them for nothing. They'll tell you what they want. They'll do the repairs, the service, and whatever on it. And you get a bill. But I just thought, well, I watched Lance doing it on his channel, and I think to myself, you know, that's not that's not out the way of that, like, is it? You know, people, it's like the injector pump. I'd watch Lance do the injector pump, and then I stripped the CAV, the DPA pump. I literally stripped it, the same as Lance did, stripped it to an empty carcass, cleaned everything, checked everything, put it all back together, resealed it all with a proper seal kit, the lot. Um, and you begin to think, well, yeah, this is this is possible, this, you know, and most of your life you're told, don't touch the injectors, don't touch the fuel pump, that, that's all, oh God, that's white man's magic, that one, you didn't touch them. So, um, so I'm, I'm looking at this and I think to myself, this is doable, this. Can, what I'm going to do when the pump arrives, I'm going to test all four injectors. We'll have a look and see what, because I, I, know the, I know they were working. When the tractor arrived, they were working. I drove the tractor on the trailer, I drove the tractor off the trailer. It started beautifully. Well, it started. So I know they're working. However, I was looking back through my pictures. It was January the 1st, 2021. No, January the 11th, 2021, when I bought that tractor. So the 16th of January, I split the tractor, bring the engine home. That engine and those injectors haven't worked since the 16th of January, 21. So the chances are they're stuck. They, the, the, the needle down in the tip is probably stuck. We will find out because we'll put them through this test and we'll see if the needles lift. <clears throat> However, what we are going to do, if we need to, we will re-tip re them. But if you watch Lance's video, he's pretty in-depth at how you go about resetting all the pressures and everything on them. And I thought, yeah, that is totally doable if you have a pump. I think it was 78 quid I spent for the pump. However, you then have the option, don't you? To go on and on and on and do other injectors and maybe save yourself a bit of money in the long run and a bit of time. Because like, I live 24, 25 mile from Auto Diesel in Newcastle. So that's a 50 mile round trip. And you've got two round trips to do because you've got to take them in and then you've got to go back and see them. Then you've got to pay the bill. So, how bad can it be? Huh? How bad can it be? Another little thing we ordered the other day. Um, Three-quarter UNC taps. Underneath the axle, those eight holes we're talking about, making the square plates for, putting the bolts up for the wheels to sit on. They are three-quarter UNC, so I've ordered the taps for them. In fact, they they will come tomorrow. They're coming tomorrow. Um, so I've ordered the taps. We're going to get those holes cleaned out. I always order a die as well. I, I like a set. When you're ordering anything like that, it's pointless just buying one tap. So I always get a tape and a plug and a die. And that way you've got a set to fix threads with, whether they're internal or external. And... Let's face it, most of these threads on these tractors just need cleaning out or straightening up a little bit. A lot of the bigger ones you can do with a, with a hand file, can't you? A little needle file. You can get in there and square them up with a needle file. But uh, and what I've started doing as well, and I don't know whether you guys be interested in this or not. I'll let you know when it's coming out. If you're interested, watch it. If you didn't like that type of thing, don't bother watching it, right? It's a montage of still images. I think at the minute, it's around about eight or nine minutes long. The stills are, I think they're eight seconds each. And it's from day one, when I bought the tractor, which was, um, which was 
which is 11th of January 21 that's for the day I bought the tractor so it starts from the tractor getting put onto the trailer behind my daughter's Jeep that I borrowed off I have to go and seek it across in Cumbria and it's through up until part one of the videos which was where the engine um, I, we're talking about what I had done to the engine that's the stills that I had taken as an aid memoir I think just to get one through the process um, and it's, it's those stills just linked up together in some sort of sensible order about like stripping the front axles off cleaning them painting them doing the steering gear I just wish that I really had started the video bit earlier because there's a lot of really good things in there um, like doing the recirculating ball nut off the steering gear you know it just I wish I had took videos of that instead because trying to explain to somebody the the way that I rebuilt that uh, it would have been so much easier to have it on a video and show you what was going on but it's it is what it is so that'll be coming out soon as I say if you're not into these montages of stills don't don't waste your time with it you know but if you want to find out how we got to where we were in part one it's a little bit of a history for you all right silly season i think we're in nearly we're nearly an end to silly season um i think gemma has got 25 or 30 acres to cut and bring in and i think that would be it silly season's nearly over well one of the last loads coming off the field i think we've got about two load left down there um and then there will be another field to do but you never know we've got that done that i just i don't know this the last 25 30 acres i've got no idea where she's going to put the straw because every shed is full back on the farm i'll get i'll grab another couple of pictures and we'll put them up there of the sheds Johnny was trying to squeeze bales in everywhere the other night when we come back off because the last load, that tractor that you see here, we just got that back on the farm and it started to rain again. So Johnny was working his little tail off, scooting around with the loader, trying to get bales pushed in on top of the, the big shed. Um, but just, and this is why there isn't any room at the farm to rebuild the tractor over there I know people will be looking and go well you've got no room at home but you've got all those big massive sheds on the farm well we haven't because every inch of space across at the farm is accounted for in some way or other um, the floor might be empty today but it might be full tomorrow or like tomorrow that's all of our Aberdeen Angus girls that are due to carve within the next couple of days couple of weeks they're coming in and going into the big cow shed so it's not like you can clear a corner and put yourself in a corner and set yourself up and carry on with the work because it just life isn't like that on the farm the space is at a premium so we just persevere with what we've got a lot more than what a lot of people have got that shed's full the other one. This shed's full. Got some little suckling calves on that side. There's a roadway in the middle of that through so we can move the bulls from the pens into their into their area. Right. Right then. Have a quick walk around, see what we've getting this week, see what we're getting done. Um We'll have a look at what we've got on our bench here. Eh? So this week, our steel's arrived. We've got our box section here. Our six mil plate here. These are two bits of scrap from my last bits of six mil that we had. Plan is, we're going to cut out of here two plates, the equivalent size of the hitch plates for to go underneath that axle. This box section, we're going to get cut into bits and welded in like that. These caps 
I'm going to get put on the ends, hole drilled through, a nut. Was it 19? I think it's a nut, I can't remember. 19 mil, I can't remember what size they are. Where are they? That size. We're going to get a nut welded in here so it'll be inside so we can screw into it and then put a lock nut on the outside to lock it up tight. But that's the plan with the new feet. And because they're going under the axle, they'll all be in compression. Now, that's got to be stronger than having a long leg that's held on by a little bit or a few bolts up at the top. And speaking of the hitch plates, my three quarter taps arrived the other day. So we've had them through the eight holes in here where the hitch plates go. Um, now, the problem we came across, why we were cleaning out those eight holes at three quarter UNC for the hitch plate attachment was the tap handles, the tap wrench handles kept trying to come into contact with the wheel flanges and with the the diff casing. So you've got to be able to raise, you've got to be able to raise the wrench up above that. This is what I this is what I did. So you've got your three-quarter tap with the tap wrench on here. The handles kept hitting the wheel, the flanges. So this is what I did. Half inch socket extension. Yeah. Put your ratchet on there, put your socket on there. Normally, if you turn it upside down, it fits on top of the tap. Stick a tap wrench on there. Right? That's near enough half inch that it's not I think it's about I think it's 12 mil actually. Let's measure it and see. Let's not be guessing. Let's get the vernier out here and we'll have a measure. <clears throat> here we'll go. It's 11.17 or in real terms 0.442 of an inch. So, but as I say, those nice little fit straight on top of there gets your tap wrench way out the way. Makes life easy, and that's what we're all about, isn't it? As you saw previously, axles painted and chocolate all good, busy hardening off there now. Now then, when the video comes out, you'll notice that I painted it at the front of the garage, right? I learned through experience with me Lister, you do not paint in direct sunlight. What'll happen, you'll get your paint on, it'll look beautiful, it'll go all shiny, it'll form a skin because of the sun, it'll form a skin over the top that seals everything. The solvents from the skin will evaporate and it will become touch dry, but it will never harden because the solvents that's under the skin cannot then escape and it will always remain soft. I noticed this with my Lister. I had the three bearers that the Lister, the generator and the engine was going to sit on uh, and I painted them green, sprayed them green, left them outside to cure, to, to go off. They became touch dry, brought them in, hung them up in the garage for about a week, week and a half. After that time I had a little job to do. So I put a towel on my shelf here and I simply put the little, the little channel bars just under their own weight, put them on top of the towel so they didn't get scratched. When I went back to them they were all marked on the bottom with the pattern of the towel. And I did a bit of looking on YouTube, a bit of research on Google, and it comes up with this, that if you paint them in direct sunlight, they form this skin. The solvents ca can't degas is what they call it, they can't degas. 
The paints underneath always remain soft. Looks hard on the top, looks good on the top. As soon as you start putting any pressure on it, or even if you put your finger on and pull, you end up with a drag mark. So that's why when I painted that axle, yes, it was out there at the front of the garage and it looks like it's in direct sunlight, but the instant I stopped painting, I shut the door. And I kept the door shut till I was happy that the paint had flashed sufficiently to take the next coat. Then I got the next coat, repeat prescription, and then I got the final coat. Then the garage door got shut immediately with that inside. And it was in here for the best part of 24 hours, like that. Now, you've just seen it there, it's standing there now, it's still flashing and hardening, but it hasn't got the solid skin that's created by the sun, heating all the metal up and degassing the surface. So, little tip, never paint in direct sunlight. After you've painted, don't put your stuff outside in the sunlight to dry. Not gonna work, all right? A little oil pressure gauge. That came this week. Now then, then we've got little electric lights and clamps and nuts and bolts and all sorts with it. But this is just, this is just for me, for my self-satisfaction. There, oh, there we go. All I'm going to do, this is an M8 fitting on the back of here. It's a quarter BSP T in the block. I'm going to rig up a, a piece of wire, not a piece of wire, a piece of copper tube or a capillary tube from here to the block. This will just be kept separate from the engine. I want to turn, I want to spin this engine on the starter motor only because it, I don't, I'm not going to fire it at that point. I just want to spin it and I want the oil pressure to come up. I want to see this engine's got oil pressure before I attempt to fire it. You hear tales of people spending an awful lot of time and effort doing their engines, they fire them up, assuming they've got oil pressure, and within minutes you've just destroyed everything you've done in the last few months. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put this on, spin it. When the injector pump comes, we'll rattle them injectors through. If they need re-tipping, they need re-tipping, whatever, they'll get done. We'll get them in, and we'll see if we can get it fired up, eh? Get some fuel into it, see if we can get it fired up. So I'm reading through my comments, and I get a comment of Ken Simpson. He used to be Elton lad, born and bred in the, in the colliery rose here. Um, and he mentioned, uh, he mentioned that the last time, I think it was the last yarns, I was talking about stables at Ellington that we used to have. And he mentioned uh, the ones opposite the plough owned by Maureen. Well, they were rented by Maureen from British Coal. Um, and that led back to a little bit of a story. I don't know if you just want to hear it, but it led back to a little bit of a story. When my daughter was, was coming up to her eighth birthday, and she came into the sitting room one day at home in Ellington, and she says, um, Dad, can I have a pony for my birthday? And I said, uh, as you would, as a very good father, of course you can, darling. If you can find a stables to keep your pony in and that you can walk to um, so that when mum and dad's at work, you can walk and look after this pony and it's safe. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll buy you a pony. Bearing in mind, we had lived in Ellington for about 10 years at this point. I hadn't even seen a horse in Ellington. I thought I was safe as houses. The instant I said, of course I'll buy you a pony, me darling. My daughter smiling went, I've got one. I've got a steel. And it's like, yeah, right, where? And it was the stables opposite the plough. She, um, me, me, me wife, Deb, I found out this about 30 years later. My wife had worked in cahoots with Gemma for to get this pony. Um, as Ken, Ken says he learned to ride in these stables when Maureen had them back in the 70s. Well, Deb did the same. Deb learned to ride at these stables with Maureen. And that's how she knew they were there. I didn't know they were there. I never. 
I had been courting Deb or, and since I was 21 year old. Deb always lived in Ellington, I lived in Stake Ford. Um, used to come to Ellington just with every single night of the week for years. Didn't know those stables there. But anyway, so we ended up with the stables. And the stables were pretty run down. The roof was seen better days, the doors had seen better days, the interior was a little bit of a builder storage yard and stabling. Um and I think we had been there with with Silky, Gemma's pony was called Silky. Um I'll show you a picture of her. Right, that was Gemma on Silky up at Otterburn doing a cross country trials. So anyway, yes, Deb Deb learned to ride in these stables. So obviously she knew they were there. Totally hoodwinked by an eight year old. And as I say, it was some 30 year later, I think Gemma was, as I say, it should be 38, 39 last year, the year before. That's when I found out that the pair of them had been working in cahoots to get this stable and this pony sorted out. Anyway, we ended up approaching British Coal because they were rented off British Coal. So we ended up um, approaching British Coal having a discussion with them about the condition of the stables and then taking over the, the license because they were licensed for 11 and a half months every year. Um, they couldn't be licensed for 12 months due to the fact that that would create some sort of tenancy agreement and they didn't want that. But anyway, um, so we took over, we, me and my dad, God rest his soul, um, we spent a lot of time up there fixing the roofs um, putting new doors on, sorting doors out, getting rid of old materials, changing the shape of the boxes so that they were safer and cleaner for the horses to live in, tidying up all around it, making it a nicer, better place for even for the people that were living around there. Um, British Coal came along a few years later, decided they wanted it back because they were going to build uh, a little estate of bungalows up there. So during the negotiations, we ended up then with the old colliery stables, which was just across the road here, we ended up with the colliery state, the surface stables and the fields for them. But that's how you get hoodwinked by an eight year old. Hmm. So, <clears throat> right. Well, that's it for this weekly yarn then. Um, thank you very much for visiting. Hope you've enjoyed it, even though we whinge on a little bit at times, but I hope you enjoyed it. Um, there will be a video out this week with regard to gearbox, axle, engine getting put together. That will happen this week. We're halfway through that now. Um, we will get the legs made probably a day or tomorrow, but we will get that video out this week at some point. Um, so keep watching. Don't forget now, if you like my videos, give us a thumbs up, like, subscribe, tell your friends. The channel is growing very steadily. I'm over the moon. I really do appreciate all your efforts and all your time to sit and watch the videos and put your comments in. Appreciate every single comment that comes in. And I love when you guys come back with suggestions and in ways that we can improve things. Um, things that maybe I've getting wrong with the tractor that we need to revisit and have a look at see what we've done but please keep it up keep going don't forget don't overthink it it's only nuts and bolts see you in the next one take care now